Story one. I sat by the window, watching the endless waters of the Pacific Ocean flicker beneath me. The sun reflected off the water's surface, creating dazzlingly bright glints, and it seemed as though the whole world was in a state of eternal tranquility. Inside the airplane cabin there was silence, broken only by the soft hum of the engines and occasional conversations among passengers. I felt remarkably relaxed, immersed in reading a book, occasionally distracted by the captivating views outside the window. Suddenly my idol was disrupted. The plane jolted. Initially I thought it was just turbulence, but then came other more powerful jolts. I noticed the faces of passengers transitioning from mild unease to palpable fear. Flight attendants, attempting to maintain calm, quickly went down the aisle, urging everyone to fasten their seatbelts. The air in the cabin grew tense as the plane began to lose altitude. Everything around vibrated and creaked, as if an old machine at its limit. The serene world around me, which had seemed so calm and peaceful just moments ago, suddenly turned into chaos. Panic began to grip the passengers. Cries and wails filled the cabin, contrasting with the previously prevailing silence. I huddled in my seat, looking out through the window and seeing the plane's wing bending and creaking under the pressure of unseen forces. The ocean, once so beautiful and boundless, now looked like an inexorable, menacing abyss, ready to swallow us. As the plane shook with renewed force, oxygen masks suddenly hissed and crackled from the ceiling. I grabbed one and quickly put it on, following the instructions. Around me, passengers in panic tried to do the same. Some froze in shock, unable to perform even this simple action. Fear gripped my heart. Thoughts of home, family, and unrealized dreams raced through my mind. In that moment I realized the fragility of our existence, how quickly everything can change. Just when it seemed like the plane was starting to stabilize, the unthinkable happened. A terrifying, ear-splitting roar shook the cabin, and the plane, like a toy in the hands of an invisible giant, sharply bent. Through the noise and vibration, I felt the floor beneath me give way, and my gaze met the open expanse of the Pacific Ocean below us. The plane tore in half, and I, like everyone else around, was doomed to witness this disaster from within. The force dividing the plane was so great that the moment seemed like eternity. Time slowed down, allowing me to notice every detail. How seats ripped from the floor, how passengers' personal belongings soared into the air, creating chaos with books, phones, blankets. People screamed, but their voices drowned in the deafening roar of destruction. And then I lost consciousness. I woke up to the rustle of leaves and birdsong nearby. Moments later I realized that my body was unnaturally constrained, and the seatbelt dug into my chest, holding me in the seat, which seemed to be suspended in the air. My eyes slowly adjusted to the light, and I began to look around, trying to understand where I was. The first thing that caught my eye was the tree branches, wrapping around the seat as if nature was trying to embrace or prevent me from falling. I tried to move, but a painful bout of dizziness made me stop. My body felt alien, and every movement caused discomfort. Taking a deep breath, I felt a strong thirst, as if I hadn't drunk anything for eternity. Carefully, trying not to provoke a new wave of dizziness, I looked down and truly realized my situation for the first time. The height at which I was perched instantly caused nausea. I realized that I was stuck in the seat high among the trees, which closely hugged the sandy shore. My gaze darted around, trying to find any support. But all around were only forest, ocean, and... Airplane wreckage. It was scattered all along the shore. Passengers' belongings clothes, books, photographs. All of it now lay on the ground, 
creating a sad landscape of destruction. And among the trees and on the ground, I saw something that made my heart stop. Bodies of people. Not only the height, but also the realization of the tragedy that had happened to these people, to us, made me feel sick. I tried to scream, but my voice got stuck in my throat, leaving only a quiet moan. Memories of the flight, of the moment of the crash, began to flash through my mind, but they were incomplete and didn't give the full picture of what had happened. Hanging amidst the branches, as I tried to regain my composure, something caught my attention. I noticed movement among the wreckage and lifeless bodies on the ground. My heart froze. At first I thought it was rescuers, but the longer I watched, the more horrifying this discovery seemed. The figure skulking among the ruins was too large and agile for a human, too dark and menacing. Upon closer inspection, I realized that before me was not a human. It was something else. A humanoid wolf, a creature from nightmares, with a massive, terrifying maw and thick fur covering its entire body. It darted from body to body with inhuman agility, occasionally pausing to wrench heads from the unfortunate crash victims. I froze, barely daring to breathe, trying to remain unnoticed. My heart pounded furiously, each beat echoing in my ears, as if it could be heard for miles around. The sight was repulsive, and I felt nauseous. The monster continued its grim task, paying no attention to me. At one point, it came so close to my hiding spot among the branches that I could discern every scar and patch of fur on its body. I silently prayed that it wouldn't look up, wouldn't notice me. With each step it took, it seemed as though the ground trembled and the air filled with a wild, animalistic scent. Finally, to my indescribable relief, the creature passed by without detecting my presence. It continued on its path from corpse to corpse, gathering heads into a horrifying necklace around its neck. With each step, it moved farther away until it disappeared into the dense green darkness of the forest, leaving behind only dead silence and a sense of unspeakable horror. I remained suspended between heaven and earth, trembling with fear and cold, trying to gather my thoughts. What was that? Why was it doing such dreadful things? Questions swirled in my head, for which I had no answers. The only thing I knew for sure, I needed to get out of here before that creature returned. After waiting for some time, I decided it was time to act. I grabbed the seatbelt with both hands, feeling my fingers numb from tension and effort. With difficulty, gasping for breath and fearing to look down, I pressed the buckle, and suddenly the world tilted. The belt gave way, and I, barely maintaining balance, quickly grabbed the nearest branch, its bark digging into my palms. My heart pounded wildly in my chest as I, weighing each movement, began to cautiously descend, moving from branch to branch. My muscles burned from the strain, and my hands trembled violently. Finally, I found myself on the ground, on my knees amidst leaves and small twigs, exhausted from thirst and fatigue. I was desperately thirsty. Trying to regain my mental balance, I slowly made my way through the wreckage of the plane, trying to avoid the dead bodies. My gaze involuntarily slid over scattered belongings, searching for something that could help me survive. And then I saw them. A couple of water bottles miraculously left intact amidst the chaos of destruction. My heart swelled with joy, and forgetting for a moment about the exhaustion and pain in every muscle, I hurried towards them. With difficulty, I opened the cap of the first bottle and took a deep drink, feeling relief and strength with every sip. The water had a slightly bitter taste, but at that moment, it seemed like the most delicious drink I had ever tasted. Sitting on the ground amidst the wreckage and chaos, 
I tried to gather my thoughts and plan my next steps. It was crystal clear to me that the top priority was to ensure my survival by securing everything necessary. Also, I needed to stay vigilant. That creature could return at any moment. Firstly, I decided to focus on food and water supplies. I scoured the area, searching for anything that could serve as sustenance, but found only a few packs of dry biscuits and a couple of water bottles. This would barely last a couple of days. Water especially was a problem. I would need to search for drinkable sources later. Next, I began searching for useful items. Any object could prove extremely valuable. After a lengthy search, I found a knife, blankets, a flashlight, a first aid kit, and rummaging through someone's suitcase, a couple of t-shirts in my size. I decided to gather all the found items in one place for easy access. Procuring fire was third on the list of priorities. Fire was essential not only for warmth and cooking, but also for protection against wild animals and as a signal for rescuers. Especially, fire was crucial for purifying drinking water. Once I watched a survival show where participants prioritized finding a source of drinking water and a way to make fire. Drinking untreated water was dangerous. It needed to be boiled. However, I couldn't find matches or a lighter anywhere and starting a fire by friction was a difficult task. So I decided to check the pockets of the decapitated bodies. Overcoming nausea, I began to search their pockets, and finally, near the body of a burly man, I found a lighter in the pocket of his jeans. I flicked it, and the fire lit up, which greatly pleased me. The next task was to drag the bodies and bury them, which was perhaps the most challenging trial not only physically, but also morally. I knew it had to be done to prevent disease spread and attracting predators. I decided to search for a suitable spot nearby and, at least symbolically, bury them, paying respects to the deceased. It took the remainder of the day, and it was beginning to get dark. After some contemplation, I decided to stay close to the crash site. Rescuers would likely start their search from here. I resolved that tomorrow, I would need to create an SOS signal at a visible location, using branches, rocks, or any other available materials. Determining my current location became the next crucial task. I needed to understand whether I was on an island or the mainland. This knowledge was critically important for planning further survival steps. If rescuers didn't arrive soon, I would have to start exploring the surroundings for food, water, and possibly civilization. Before it got completely dark, I managed to find thick bushes not far from the shore. This place seemed like an ideal shelter for the night, hidden and protected, yet close enough to the crash site for easy access to the wreckage if rescuers arrived. I moved all the found items there, including a couple of water bottles, dry rations, and medical supplies. I laid a piece of cloth I found among the wreckage on the ground. It was supposed to serve as my mattress. I covered the entrance to my shelter with branches to make it as inconspicuous as possible for anyone who might be nearby. Not starting a fire seemed like the most reasonable decision. Despite the cold night ahead, which promised to be tough, I understood that a fire could attract the attention of that creature, the humanoid wolf, which roamed among the bodies and wreckage. As night descended, shrouding the land in its dark cloak, I settled in, trying to get as comfortable as possible, and despite all my fears and worries, soon fell asleep. The sleep was troubled, filled with dreams of home, family, and the inevitable fear of the unknown. Suddenly, I was awakened by a strange noise from the shore, scraping, rustling, as if someone or something was rummaging through the wreckage. Carefully, trying not to make a sound, I crawled to the edge of the bushes and peeked outside. In the light of the moon, I saw him. That same creature, the humanoid wolf, had returned. It moved slowly among the wreckage, occasionally pausing to sniff or pick something up from the ground. 
Its massive figure stood out against the nocturnal landscape, and its eyes occasionally gleamed in the darkness when caught by the moonlight. I held my breath, watching its actions, my heart pounding in unison with each of its steps. But then, as suddenly as it appeared, the creature vanished, melting into the night, leaving only the sound of waves and wind in its wake. I crawled back into my hiding place, trying to calm my pounding heart. The night was restless. My thoughts kept returning to what I had seen on the shore and the possibility of encountering the unknown threat face to face. Waking up in the morning, I felt tired as if I hadn't slept at all. Nevertheless, there was much work to be done, and I couldn't afford to despair. I had breakfast, carefully rationing the remaining food supplies. Every piece of biscuit now seemed as precious as gold, and I understood that I needed to find a way to replenish my supplies before they ran out. After breakfast, I got to work. Using branches and rocks, I assembled huge SOS letters in an open space near the camp. This task took me several hours and a lot of effort, but I knew it was necessary to attract the attention of rescuers. Each letter laid out on the ground seemed like a cry for help that I hoped would be heard. Then I began searching for a water source. Venturing into the depths of the forest, I discovered a small stream with clean, cool water. I was lucky. I filled the bottles and allowed myself a moment of relief. Having water meant a chance of survival, and I felt a surge of strength. During my search, I also came across berries, beautiful and enticing, but I didn't know if they were poisonous or not. My intuition warned me to beware of unknown berries, and I decided not to risk it. Without knowledge of the local flora, eating something at random would be too dangerous. Realizing that I also needed to find a source of food, I began to contemplate plans for the future. In the forest, there were bound to be fruits, nuts, or even small animals that could be caught. However, as it was getting dark, I decided it was best to return to camp and postpone these tasks until tomorrow. When I returned to camp, I again decided not to light a fire. Although I needed to boil water, I decided to drink the remaining. I had dinner and returned to my shelter in the bushes. The night passed surprisingly calmly, without anxious sounds or unexpected appearances. In the morning, I finally decided to light a fire. Although this decision didn't come easily, as I remembered the possible threat posed by the creature wandering at night, the risk seemed justified. Clean water was a guarantee of health and survival. On the shore, among the wreckage and items washed up by the waves, I found a piece of iron that could serve as a container for boiling water. It was a fortunate find, allowing me not only to boil water but also to diversify my diet a bit if I managed to find something else to eat. I gathered twigs and dry branches, carefully stacking them into a pile for a fire. With the help of the found lighter, the fire was kindled without much effort. The flames crackled, illuminating the morning with new colors and filling the air with the smell of smoke. The iron piece, serving as my pot, I placed on the fire, filling it with water from the stream. After the water had boiled for a sufficient time, I removed the pot from the fire and let it cool down. After some time, when the water had cooled to a safe temperature, I carefully poured it into empty bottles found earlier. Now, with a supply of clean water, I felt slightly more prepared for what lay ahead. Next, I needed to find something to snack on. Exploring the beach for food, I hoped to find coconuts, which could serve as both food and water sources. However, to my disappointment, not a single coconut was in sight. The prospect of venturing further down the beach into the impenetrable forest to search for food frightened me. I wasn't ready to face the unknown lurking in its shadowy depths yet. After some deliberation, I remembered the berries I had found earlier. They seemed familiar to me, and in a moment of desperation, 
I decided to take a risk. Approaching the spot where I had found them, I saw plenty of red berries sparkling enticingly in the sunlight. Carefully trying one, I found it to be quite palatable, and I began to eat them eagerly, gathering a supply in a bag. Returning to camp, I soon began to feel unwell. A feeling of dread engulfed me, realizing that perhaps the berries were indeed poisonous. In panic, I threw away the bag, the berries spilling onto the ground. Nausea overwhelmed me, and without hesitation I grabbed a bottle of water, trying to induce vomiting to cleanse my stomach of the poison. The night turned into a nightmare. I was racked with sickness, my body shaking with chills, and fever causing the world around me to sway and distort. I lay on the cold ground, exhausted and alone, as the darkness of the forest consumed me entirely. By morning, exhausted and weakened, I lost consciousness. When I woke up, the first thing I did was look at the sun and realize that lunchtime had passed already. My condition was far from ideal. My head was spinning, and my stomach was empty. The found bottle of water became my salvation. How fortunate that I stocked up on water in advance, I thought, taking small sips to avoid triggering a new bout of nausea. After lying for another hour, I finally felt like I was starting to recover. Evening was approaching, and I decided it was best to dedicate the rest of the day to rest. There was still some food left from the plane, but I realized that tomorrow I would have to look for new sources of food. The next morning, I got up early. After scanning the sky and the sea for signs of a rescue operation and finding nothing encouraging, I decided to walk along the beach in search of something edible. After a couple of miles along the sandy shore, I finally found what I had been looking for for so long coconuts. Running up to a tree, I noticed a couple of coconuts lying on the ground. Using a knife, I made a hole in one of them and drank the sweet juice, feeling how each sip brought relief and strength. Then I cracked the coconut in half and ate the flesh, savoring every bite. Having quenched my thirst and hunger, I decided to gather more coconuts for supplies. After collecting a small pile, I was about to return to camp when suddenly, in the distance further down the beach, I noticed something unusual. It was a structure resembling a lighthouse. I was greatly surprised, but at the same time I was overjoyed. It was the first sign of civilization on this island. Deciding to explore the lighthouse while it was still light, I headed towards it, keeping in mind that I still had enough time to return to camp by evening. As I approached the lighthouse, it seemed more and more impressive, like a guardian standing alone at the edge of the world. Finally, I reached it and realized that the lighthouse was very ancient. The structure was tall and slender, weathered by time, with stones covered in moss and lichen. Its walls, made of roughly hewn stones, bore traces of years of struggle with the sea winds and storms. In some places, the plaster had crumbled away, exposing the sturdy but time-worn masonry. It seemed that the lighthouse had not been used for many decades, if not centuries. Rust covered the metal elements of the structure, and the door at the entrance was half open, creaking on old hinges with every gust of wind. The windows on the upper floors, where the lantern room usually is, were either boarded up or broken, leaving the interior of the lighthouse at the mercy of fate. Entering the lighthouse, I felt centuries-old dust rising into the air with every step I took. The staircase in front of me looked extremely unreliable, as if each step could crumble at the slightest touch. But despite my fears, I cautiously began to climb up. During the ascent, my attention was drawn to strange paintings on the walls, incomprehensible symbols and images, including bats, which gave the interior a sense of mystery and made me wonder about the origin of the lighthouse and its purpose. These ancient signs, 
inscribed on the walls millennia ago, created a sense of connection with a long forgotten past. Reaching the top, I found myself in a spacious room with a panoramic view of the ocean and the surrounding forest. In the center stood something remarkable, a horizontal wheel, reminiscent in shape of a ship's wheel, but lying on its side. Around the room were also various ancient paintings, among which I noticed an image of a bat and a wolf facing each other, as if they were enemies or guardians of some ancient secret. I examined the room for a long time, and when my curiosity got the better of me, I decided to try turning the wheel. At first it seemed immovable, but with more effort, I managed to move it. After several turns, the ground suddenly shook beneath my feet. A mild earthquake began. Terrified by my actions, I heard a terrible screech to the south of the lighthouse. Looking outside, I saw a whole flock of birds rising high into the sky from deep within the forest, as if something had scared them. At that moment, I realized the folly of my actions. Maybe I released that creature outside, or something worse. The thought flashed through my mind, but then my gaze caught sight of smoke to the southeast. My heart filled with hope. It could be locals or survivors from the plain. Perhaps the tail fell in another place. The decision was made instantly. I had to head in that direction to find out what was happening there and possibly find salvation, or at least company amidst this boundless emptiness. Descending from the lighthouse, I paused for a moment to gather my thoughts and pull myself together. Before me lay a long journey through impenetrable forest, and I had to traverse it as quietly as possible. Although the discovery of the lighthouse and the impending exploration filled me with joy and hope, memories of the creature that had severed heads were still fresh in my mind. I prepared myself for caution, reminding myself that safety must come first. As I made my way through the forest, trying to make as little noise as possible, the leaves rustled beneath my feet and branches occasionally snapped, but I tried to minimize these sounds. Soon, I began to notice signs of human activity. Felled trees, tracks on the ground, and paths that seemed too smooth for the wild nature. One of such paths that I found led directly to the source of the smoke. So people lived here, I thought, but I didn't forget the need to be cautious. After about an hour of walking, the trail widened and I decided to veer off it to move along, hiding behind trees. Soon I approached the palisade. At the entrance stood a couple of natives with spears. They didn't resemble representatives of modern civilization, but rather a people lost in time. Their bodies were adorned with tattoos and huge round earrings adorned their ears. I paused, trying to assess the situation. The decision to approach and try to establish contact with them seemed too risky. What if they were hostile? What if they were connected to the creature I saw in the forest? On the other hand, they might have knowledge of the area or even offer help. After a brief hesitation, I decided not to take the risk. Until I knew how they would react to a stranger, it was better to avoid them. Carefully, Trying not to reveal my presence, I began to circumvent the meeting place, staying away from the palisade while still trying not to lose direction to the source of the smoke. Circling the palisade, I found a small opening hidden among the thickets. Deciding to take advantage of this opportunity, I carefully slipped through it and found myself inside the village. I was behind small straw huts built from local materials and covered with palm leaves. Inside the village there was silence, and I could only hear the beat of drums coming from the center of the settlement. Creeping closer, hiding behind the huts and trees, I discovered that the village was built around a large open space. In its center burned a huge bonfire, around which dozens of natives had gathered. 
They were dressed in simple clothing made of natural fabrics and adorned with various tattoos covering much of their bodies. Many of them wore round earrings and in their hands they held various items, from musical instruments to tools. The natives were engrossed in a ritual. Their bodies moved to the rhythm of the drums and their faces expressed a wide range of emotions, from joy to trance. Passion and mysticism blended in this place, creating a unique atmosphere. In the center of this gathering, I saw two people tied to stakes, a woman with European features and a young man of Asian descent. Their faces were filled with fear and despair, and around them, the natives danced, creating a frightening spectacle. My heart froze with horror at the thought that these people might become victims of a cannibalistic ritual. I noticed hungry looks from women and children directed at the captives. Some of them held knives and plates in their hands. I watched all this in disbelief, unable to comprehend it. I began to think of ways to save them, but nothing came to mind. I wasn't a hero. Rushing out and trying to fight the natives would be foolish, and within a minute, I would be tied to a stake. As the natives brought a couple of wooden stakes in the shape of the letter X and placed them next to the bonfire opposite each other, the atmosphere in the village became even more tense. It became clear to me that they were preparing for something horrifying. When they began to pull out the stake to which the woman was tied, I understood their intent. They were going to roast the captives alive. My heart froze in anticipation of the inevitable. But then a terrible scream rang out, causing everyone to freeze. The drums fell silent, and the dance ceased. The natives looked around in terror, their faces distorted with fear. Suddenly, something invisible flew through the air and snatched one of them away. Panic gripped the village. Cries and chaos filled the square. Some of the natives grabbed bows, trying to defend themselves, but the creature moved with incredible speed, like lightning, tearing its victims away one by one. By some miracle, one of the natives managed to wound the creature, angering it. It emitted a loud cry and latched onto the man. Now that it was visible, I could see it. The creature was completely bald, with bat wings growing from its back. Its bald head and a pair of long fangs protruding from its mouth gave it a vampiric appearance. The creature sank its teeth into the man's neck and began to suck his blood, eliciting desperate cries and attempts at salvation. Soon, the village emptied as the surviving natives scattered in horror, leaving behind only chaos and destruction. Once the attack of the terrifying creature subsided, and the last echoes of its screams dissolved into the evening air. I looked around. The village seemed abandoned, and I realized that this was my chance to help the prisoners. Carefully crouching, I made my way to them. In their eyes, already resigned to their dreadful fate, a spark of hope ignited when they saw me. First, I freed the woman. The stake to which she was to be tied had already been torn from the ground and abandoned during the natives' chaotic flight. After freeing her, I noticed her rubbing her hands and feet, trying to regain feeling after being motionless for so long. She opened her mouth to say something, but I immediately put a finger to my lips, signaling for silence. Then I headed to the second captive. Once both were free, we quietly made our way to the exit of the village, slipped through the hole in the palisade, and delved deeper into the forest. After covering some distance, we decided to take a short break. The woman looking at me in astonishment asked what the creature was. I replied that I didn't know. Then I introduced myself, saying my name was Mark. She responded that her name was Anna and she was from England. The third guy looked at us, not understanding our conversation. When I pointed to myself and Anna, calling out our names, he understood and introduced himself as Lee. 
Anna explained that Lee didn't speak English, only Chinese, but they had found a way to communicate. She explained that they were in the tail section of the plane when it crashed. Only the two of them survived. One night, while they were waiting for help, the natives came and abducted them. Sitting in the shelter surrounded by dense forest, we contemplated our next steps. I shared with Anna and Lee my ideas on how we could survive. First and foremost, we needed to determine whether we were on an island or on the mainland. Anna reported seeing from the plane that we were approaching land. It was an island with a volcano in the middle. This knowledge significantly altered our plans. Realizing that we faced the challenge of survival in the harsh conditions of the island, I told them about the encounter with another monster I had faced earlier. Anna was astonished by this story. We concluded that the safest course of action would be to stay closer to the shore in case someone came to rescue us while avoiding any dangers lurking deeper in the island. The idea of building a raft and attempting to leave the island was dismissed as unrealistic. The size of the Pacific Ocean and the lack of necessary skills and materials made this plan too risky. We continued to discuss our plans when suddenly, in the silence of the forest, we heard sounds, rustling and whispers. It was the natives, and they were approaching our shelter. Quietly, barely breathing, we began to retreat deeper into the forest, trying not to make any unnecessary noise. But our presence did not go unnoticed. The natives spotted us and began to chase us. Fear drove us and we ran through the dense vegetation of the forest, dodging obstacles at full speed. When we emerged into a clearing, arrows flew at us. With a heart ready to burst from my chest, we continued to run, dodging the dangers flying towards us. Suddenly, Anna stumbled and fell. Lee and I immediately stopped and helped her up when a spear impaled the ground next to me. It was a reminder that every delay could cost us our lives. We resumed our flight. Ahead of us lay open terrain littered with large volcanic rocks. It was not an ideal hiding place, but we had no choice. We had to keep running. But suddenly, as we crossed the rough terrain, the ground literally gave way beneath our feet, and we fell into a deep pit. Coming to my senses, I looked around and realized that we were in a cave. Looking up, I saw a huge hole in the cave's ceiling, through which the sky could be seen. Above us, the natives leaned over with spears at the ready. Realizing the danger, I grabbed Anna and Lee and ran deeper into the cave. Behind us, the sound of falling spears echoed, a clear sign that the natives were not backing down. Taking a brief moment to catch our breath, I instinctively pulled a flashlight out of my bag. Its beam of light instantly dispelled the darkness and we realized that we were in a man-made cave. The walls were smooth and even, indicating that the cave had been carved out of the rock centuries ago. We sat, lost in thought about what to do next, when suddenly we noticed that the natives had begun to descend into the cave. Desperation gripped me at the thought that our pursuers were not giving up. What had we done to them? I asked myself. With no other option, we decided to continue running deeper into the cave. I turned on the flashlight and illuminated the path, trying to avoid collisions with protruding rocks and other obstacles. Our breaths merged with the echo of our footsteps, reflected off the cave walls. Soon, we came to a fork in the path. The path split into two directions, left and right. To the left, I felt a faint breeze, which could indicate an exit or at least a more spacious chamber. Lee seemed to sense the same and pointed in the same direction. Without wasting time on deliberation, we ran to the left. Voices of the natives could be heard behind us, indicating that they had not given up their pursuit. Continuing our flight from our pursuers, we soon emerged into a huge cavern, in the center of which sprawled a magnificent lake. 
Desperation engulfed me as I heard the cries of our pursuers growing closer. Dozens of evacuation plans raced through my mind, and I was ready to dive into the water to swim across the lake. But then Lee shouted and pointed at the cave wall. Approaching closer, I noticed a narrow path along the wall. It looked slippery, but we decided to take the risk and began to move slowly along it. When we had covered half the distance, Anna suddenly screamed and pointed downwards towards the surface of the water. There, in the murky depths of the lake, swam huge creatures resembling amphibians with impressive fangs. We looked at each other, realizing how lucky we were that we hadn't dared to make a desperate jump. At that moment, our pursuers burst into the cave. Seeing us, they headed towards us along the path. We froze in anticipation of spears or arrows flying at us, but it seemed that the natives had run out of ammunition and decided to catch up with us at close range. The tribesmen moved less cautiously than us, and soon one of them slipped and fell into the water. Immediately, monsters swam up to him. Water splashed, tinted red with blood, and a wild cry echoed from the man. Frozen with horror, we and the remaining tribesmen watched this horrifying spectacle. But then we snapped out of it and, seizing the moment, continued our escape along the path, striving to leave this place as soon as possible. Soon we emerged from the cavern with the lake and found ourselves in a wide corridor, which to our surprise was illuminated by yellow glowing stones. They emitted warmth, creating the illusion that lava was slowly flowing down the walls. These walls were adorned with inscriptions and ornaments, reminiscent of ancient and forgotten civilizations. But we had no time to examine the surroundings. We kept running, although our strength was gradually dwindling. Looking back, I saw our pursuers, who were not giving up. But soon we burst into an open hall, in the center of which stood a huge altar. On the altar was a massive stone wolf's head, and beneath it lay offerings of human heads. Among them, I noticed fresh heads and recalled how the monster had torn them off after the crash. The realization dawned on me that we had come straight into the lair of this creature, and despair engulfed me. We looked around for an exit, but found nothing but smooth walls. The cannibals were getting closer, and it seemed like the end. Weary, I sat down, expecting my fate, when suddenly, tribesmen rushed into the room from the corridor, heading straight towards us. At the moment when the tension reached its peak, and it seemed that there were no options left for our salvation, unexpectedly, a werewolf leaped from the ceiling right between us and the approaching cannibals. The creature with its hungry and wild gaze began to survey those around, and its powerful body tensed, ready to attack. The cannibals, seeing this monster, immediately fell to their knees, uttering something in their language. Apparently, they revered the werewolf as a sacred creature or protector. My companions and I, overwhelmed with fear and confusion, did not know what to do next. Suddenly, Lee grabbed my hand and dropped to the ground, repeating after the tribesmen. Anna and I followed his lead, kneeling beside him. The werewolf, noticing our submission, glanced at us, then back at the tribesmen. It approached them and began to sniff them, as if choosing its prey. Suddenly, it stopped at one of the men and swiftly tore off his head. Raising it up, the werewolf drank the blood, roaring loudly. After that, it turned its terrible head in our direction, and I thought our end had come. But in response to its roar, a familiar screech echoed from the ceiling. The werewolf tensed and bared its teeth, preparing for a new threat. My gaze wandered in search of an exit. Suddenly, I noticed a small tunnel behind one of the columns, barely large enough for a person to squeeze through. Pointing it out to my companions, we all understood that this was our chance. We began to crawl towards the tunnel, trying not to attract the werewolf's attention, 
which was completely absorbed in the impending battle with the bat. The werewolf made the first lunge, trying to grab the opponent with its powerful paws, but the bat deftly dodged, rising into the air. It responded with a swift dive, attempting to strike the werewolf with its claws. The sounds of their collision, loud growls and screeches filled the cavern, echoing off its walls, making everything around freeze in anticipation. The werewolf, using its strength and agility, tried to knock the opponent off course, delivering powerful blows with its paws. In turn, the bat demonstrated incredible maneuverability, avoiding direct collisions and attempting to bite the werewolf, using its sharp teeth. At some point, the battle reached its climax. The werewolf grabbed the bat by one of its wings, trying to pin it to the ground, but the bat, using all its strength, broke free, inflicting a deep wound on the werewolf's side with its claws. In pain and rage, the werewolf let out a loud howl, which reverberated off the walls of the cavern, causing everything living around to freeze. The battle continued, seemingly endless, with each participant unwilling to yield. The air was filled with the scent of blood and adrenaline. Meanwhile, we used this moment to hide in the tunnel, hoping to find a path to freedom and safety in its depths. My companions crawled in first, and as I was about to follow them, something landed near me with a dull thud. I turned my gaze to the left and saw the severed head of the werewolf. Then I looked back and saw how the bat began to kill the tribesmen, cries and screams coming from there. I hurried up and crawled into the hole when I heard a scream from behind. The creature was trying to reach out and grab me, but the gap was too small and its wings were getting in the way. I watched in fear as it tried to reach me and then it backed off. For a moment I was stunned. Then I heard Anna calling me and I continued on my way. After crawling a considerable distance, feeling the pain in our knees, we found ourselves in another room. This cave had no single source of light and I quickly pulled out my flashlight to illuminate the surroundings. Before us lay a room filled with numerous skulls. The walls, on the other hand, were adorned with ornaments and drawings, creating a gloomy and mysterious atmosphere. Especially prominent was a huge drawing in the center of the wall. It was an image of a humanoid wolf, majestically seated on a throne. Around him, people knelt. Waves emanated from the wolf, and his hand was directed towards them. Upon closer inspection, I realized that some of these people were beginning to transform, their forms distorting, indicating a possible transformation into werewolves. This discovery left us frozen in awe and horror at the mystical power depicted on the wall. Next on the wall was depicted an army of werewolves battling an army of humans. This epic battle seemed endless, but we could not see its outcome as part of the wall in this area was destroyed. Around this spot lingered the sense of an ancient battle that left no winners. Looking around for further passage, we noticed another tunnel. We had no choice but to continue our journey into the unknown. The tunnel began to slope slowly upwards, and soon we saw the starry sky through an opening in the ceiling. Emerging outside, we found ourselves in the forest. The fresh air and stars overhead after the stuffy air of the cave were truly refreshing. We sat down on the ground, trying to catch our breath and gather our thoughts after everything we had seen. The surrounding silence of the forest seemed almost unreal after the chaos and horrors we had experienced in the depths of the dungeon. I pulled out a water bottle and dry rations and shared them with my companions. They thanked me and after quenching our thirst and hunger, we decided to head back to the shore. Carefully making our way through the dense forest, we suddenly heard in the distance that piercing scream that had once again struck fear into our hearts. Trying to move as quietly as possible, we continued our journey until we reached the shore. 
Orienting ourselves by the surrounding landscape, I saw the familiar lighthouse, which to our surprise was lit. But as we approached closer, the light suddenly went out, leaving us bewildered. Without wasting time on contemplation, we decided to continue our movement. Soon we stumbled upon the pile of coconuts I had left earlier. After we had a hearty snack and took more coconuts for the journey ahead, we headed towards my camp. Arriving there exhausted, I collapsed in the bushes on my improvised mattress and fell asleep immediately. Early in the morning, I was awakened by a jolt and Anna's joyful cry. She excitedly reported that a ship was visible at sea. I jumped up instantly and saw Lee waving on the shore, trying to attract the attention of the passing vessel. For a moment, it seemed like the ship would sail past. But then we saw a boat being lowered from its side. After some time, the boat approached us, and on board were two men. We told them about our adventures, and they took us aboard the ship. The captain of the ship was amazed by our story, and informed us that the search for our plane was being conducted in a completely different location, and they had stumbled upon this island completely by chance. When I asked how they found the island, the captain replied that he had noticed the light from the lighthouse at night. At that moment, in the distance, that terrifying scream echoed again. The captain became alarmed, and we began to implore him to leave the island as soon as possible. Agreed, he ordered to raise the anchor, and we set sail. As we sailed away from the island, I looked back for the last time, realizing that this island had become both a savior and a deadly threat to me. Story 2 Go away, Robert. You're worthless. I curse you. You... you... will die... alone. She sobbed, repeating her curses. Tears mingled with the rain, streaming down her face as she stood outside my house, barefoot on the cold, wet ground. Julie, my ex-girlfriend, was drunk again. Despite the bad weather, she had come to me like a ghost from the past, from which I had tried so hard to escape. She had already broken a window. A stone lay on the floor of my living room, a reminder of her fury and despair. Julie demanded that I apologize to her in front of her. But how could I forgive someone who had repeatedly threatened my peace and safety? I knew she loved me, wanted to turn back time, but her love was as destructive as it was beautiful. In the rain, her wet hair clung to her face making her appearance even more ominous and alluring at the same time. But behind this, beauty lurked danger. I reminded myself, Don't you dare, Robert. You must forget her. Forget her, Robert. She'll hurt you again. Julie was insane. I constantly reminded myself of that, trying to keep my emotions in check. Standing next to her was her friend, Christina, who was holding her back preventing her from throwing another stone at my window. Christina, the one who had caused everything to end between us. Her friend seduced Julie, and now they were a couple. Christina always frightened me with her gaze. Skinny, muscular, covered in tattoos, she exuded the same insane energy as Julie. Rumor had it she was a real witch, and to be honest, they really suited each other. Live long and happily together, leave me alone, I told myself as I approached the window on the other side of the house so they wouldn't notice me. I needed to get out of here before the situation worsened. A minute later, I was already in the car, trying to leave behind this chaos and despair. Within minutes, I was on the highway, distancing myself from everything that could remind me of Julie. It was time to meet my friend Barry. Tonight I was planning to drink and truly relax, to try to forget everything that had happened. The semi-empty bar, shrouded in smoke and dim light, created an atmosphere of comfort and loneliness simultaneously. I sat across from Barry, who seemed to have found solace in yet another bottle. Love and death, they're one and the same. 
His voice was rough and slightly hoarse from alcohol as he continued. I loved only once and she nearly killed me. So, if you ever see Julie, I have only one piece of advice. Run, Forrest. Run. His words, despite the attempt at humor, sounded too true to laugh. I nodded, acknowledging his advice, but trying to change the subject. I've already figured that out. Let's forget about it. Have you finished the project? Barry took a sip and looked at me mockingly. No, I'm too smart for that. You know, I need someone like you in this business. You'll cover for me, won't you? You wouldn't abandon a friend, would you? His request caught me off guard, and I couldn't hold back my irritation. Again? Why? My dizziness intensified, but Barry paid no attention to it. I didn't understand what they wanted from me, and you solve these problems effortlessly. Just do it, and I promise to introduce you to my cousin, remember her? My memories of Julie resurfaced with renewed force. You're the one who introduced me to Julie, damn idiot. If it weren't for you, uh, forget it. To hell with it all, I'll do it. Send me the technical specifications, I'll take a look. Barry, smiling from ear to ear, pulled out his smartphone. I knew it. You're the best. You'll be in heaven, he said, already sending me the files. And it's done. I've sent you everything to your email. Now I've got to run. Sarah's been waiting for me for over an hour. Remember her? The tanned one from the marketing department? Barry disappeared, quickly leaving me to reflect on his words and how my life turned into a series of unexpected and undesirable events. Leaving the bar, I got into a taxi, contemplating how love and death could be so closely intertwined and why it seemed that every choice led me further down the path of greater loneliness and disappointment. Returning home didn't bring the usual sense of comfort and safety. I noticed another broken window and a stone. Oh, Julie. She was always hard to stop, I thought bitterly. Thoughts of what had happened swirled in my mind, keeping sleep at bay. Lying in the darkness, I felt how the night silence intensified my anxiety and indecision. Getting out of bed, I decided that the best solution would be to occupy myself with something to distract from the grim thoughts. Before me was a task from Barry, to create several images using AI. The prompt he sent me was so vague that most would postpone the work, but not me. Considering it an easy task, I soon generated several options each of which it seemed to me was better than the previous one. Now I'm definitely going to heaven, right, Barry? I joked to myself, finishing the work. Time mercilessly marched on and I still couldn't shake off the overwhelming thoughts. I truly felt pathetic. My contemplations about love and death grew deeper and darker. At one point sitting in front of the monitor, I pondered, could love really be so close to death? My thoughts unexpectedly shifted to AI. Lately, I had been thinking a lot about how these machines perceive us, sometimes creating images so vivid and detailed that it seemed they saw us better than we saw ourselves. And then, inspired and simultaneously oppressed by these thoughts, I entered a new query in the search bar. Depict the face of my killer. The moment I hit the Enter key, I realized that perhaps I acted impulsively. After all, there was a certain darkness and unpredictability inherent in the very essence of creating images by AI. These thoughts about how artificial intelligence perceives us, how it creates images that carry a certain threat or warning, occupied my mind all night long. I pondered how these machines could see the world, our emotions, our fears. Sometimes it seemed like they were capable of capturing the essence of something far beyond our reach. The clock showed one in the morning. The room was filled with silence, disturbed only by my heavy sighs. Thoughts of love, death, and artificial intelligence intertwined in my consciousness, offering no respite. The night promised to be long and sleepless. 
the images on the screen slowly took on their final form, leaving me in a state of genuine astonishment and unease. Typically, in response to a query, four images appear, each slightly different from the others. But this time, all four faces, or rather muzzles, of the animal that I saw before me were so identical that it gave me a sense of déjà vu. Each image featured the same creature, powerful with large fangs and black fur as dark as night. Its muscles were taut like strings, lending an aura of menacing majesty to its form. This beast, looking incredibly realistic, bore no signs of being created by artificial intelligence. There were no usual distortions typical of such images, no unnatural details or strange light spots. The creature's gaze was filled with vibrant energy, causing me to repeatedly return to the thought that before me was not just a picture created by a machine, but something greater. Each of the four muzzles of the creature was turned towards the observer, their gazes filled with unfathomable depth. The creature's sharp and glistening fangs seemed capable of turning me into prey in an instant. Its claws, looking no less dangerous, seemed poised for attack. But the strangest sensation was that the beast wasn't just looking at me. It was studying me. Its gaze was full of confidence and arrogance, as if it knew I was watching it. This feeling was reinforced by the fact that in each image, the beast stood next to a door covered in strange patterns and symbols that seemed familiar to me. But I couldn't recall where I had seen these patterns and symbols. The muzzle of the beast, curled in an enigmatic smile, evoked mixed feelings. On one hand, this expression could be interpreted as mockery on the other, as a challenge. Its crimson black eyes, seeming like bottomless wells, pierced through me, making my heart beat faster. Despite the beast's seeming aggression, its posture and facial expression suggested that it was awaiting my actions. I felt a sudden urge to delete the image, block access to the AI that created them, and perhaps even get rid of the laptop. But despite the inner voice urging action, I remained motionless, mesmerized, and simultaneously shocked by these visualizations. When I finally tore my gaze away from the screen, it was almost two in the morning. How much time had I spent? immersed in studying this ominous yet remarkably realistic image. After the unexpected encounter with the unknown beast in the digital realm, it seemed important to return to reality, to something familiar and understandable. It's just an image, I reassured myself, trying to dismiss the nagging feeling of unease. To restore my confidence in the predictability of technology, I decided to conduct an experiment. I entered a new query. Depict my love. The screen came to life, presenting me with a series of images. Various figures and faces of girls appeared on the screen, each reflecting an idealized image of possible love. They were all different, yet at the same time exactly what I expected to see in response to my query. These images were standard without any deviations, precisely following the AI algorithms. My curiosity only intensified. I continued to experiment, entering different combinations of words and queries, but the results were predictable. The images I received in response were diverse, but none of them evoked the same sense of uncertainty and unease as the previous photos with the beast. With each new query, I became more convinced that the incident with the beast was nothing more than an anomaly, a glitch in the AI code. It's just a coincidence, I repeated to myself, trying to convince not only my mind, but also the inner feeling that still troubled me. I wanted to believe that everything was explainable and logical, that the world of AI was predictable and adhered to clear rules. But deep inside, I couldn't shake the thought that I had encountered something inexplicable, 
something beyond the bounds of familiar perception. This thought haunted me. The feeling of loneliness grew with each step as I descended further down the concrete spiral ramp of the underground parking garage. The echo of my footsteps reverberated in the emptiness, creating the illusion of someone else's presence in this labyrinth of steel structures. My car seemed to have dissolved into thin air, and ahead loomed the sign, Emergency Exit. An inner voice urged me toward this exit, as if sensing trouble ahead. Passing rows of parked cars, I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. The metal seemed not just cold and lifeless, it exuded a sense of threat, as if the cars concealed something more than meets the eye. Turning around one of the concrete columns, I came face to face with what I had feared. The beast. Its black fur seemed denser than the night itself, and its eyes, bright red, gleamed like two fires in the darkness. The corners of its mouth were curled in a menacing snarl, bearing sharp teeth. I barely had time to be frightened before the beast was upon me, knocking me onto the cold concrete. The sensation of its weight, its clawed paws digging into my flesh, and its teeth tearing through my clothes was so realistic that my mind refused to believe the illusory nature of what was happening. Blow after blow, each time its claws sank into me, I felt not only physical pain, but also despair at my helplessness before this monster. Its fangs sank into my flesh with incredible force again and again. I tried to defend myself, but I was powerless against its strength. Awakening was instantaneous, my heart pounding as if trying to break free from my chest. Though I was drenched in cold sweat, I felt relief at the realization of reality. Staggering, I made my way to the bathroom where cold water became my salvation, helping me regain my breath. How could a single image affect me so deeply? The question echoed in my mind as I succumbed to a sudden urge to check the image again. Opening the laptop, I found that the image of the beast had disappeared, leaving only an error message behind. None of my attempts to retrieve it were successful. The screen coldly reflected my troubled face, and deep down, I felt a sense of relief. However, a new, even darker idea began to take shape in my mind. With some apprehension, yet at the same time genuine curiosity, I approached the computer, ready to make a new query. My fingers nervously danced across the keys as I typed, What is my killer doing right now? This question, as expected, was more than strange, even to myself. Just think how strange it sounds in the dead of night, but I needed answers. As soon as the query was sent, the screen came to life, displaying four blurry blue-black squares. At first glance, they seemed entirely ordinary, devoid of any information, just another standard AI-generated image. I even felt some relief thinking that my fears had been unfounded, but my relief was premature. Leaning closer to the screen, I began to discern details in the images. From the depths of the blue-black shadows emerged contours. A mattress thrown on the floor in some semi-ruined building, fur strewn in a corner, and an old abandoned room where a figure lay sprawled on the mattress. It was the figure of a young woman, sleeping or perhaps unconscious. My heart froze. The image was so realistic and detailed that I couldn't look away from it. The image suddenly disappeared, replaced by an error message. Attempts to retrieve the picture were unsuccessful. When I reached out to technical support, their response only deepened my confusion. They claimed there were no records of my queries or the images received. It was impossible. I had seen those images myself. Thoughts swirled in my head. How could technical support know nothing? Didn't my queries leave any trace in their systems, or was it something more, something beyond a simple software glitch? 
And why did the images of the beast change to a photograph of a young woman? These questions tormented me. I spent the rest of the night pondering. At dawn, when the first rays of sunlight barely pierced through the curtains of my room, I was already up. The night had been restless, but it was time to go to work. The day in the office felt endless. Every spare moment, I secretly opened my laptop and once again turned to the AI. Queries followed one after another. Where does my killer live? My killer's house from the street. Where is my killer now? But the responses the AI gave me were disappointing. The images were blurry, devoid of specificity, as if the machine stubbornly refused to give me the exact information I needed. I realized there was some trick, a combination of words that yielded the result I needed. And I had to spend hours upon hours at the keyboard to find the key to this puzzle. And then in one of those moments, as I tried to formulate a new query once again, understanding dawned on me. The machine couldn't give me an answer if I didn't specifically ask about it, about the killer. All other queries led nowhere. This realization was breakthrough. Throughout the day, I made several more queries, refining and modifying them each time, trying to circumvent the AI's implicit limitations. And at one point, I got what I was looking for. Amidst a multitude of vague responses, there appeared an image that made my heart stop. It was Christina, the woman who stole Julie from me. Before me on the screen was her, and this discovery shook me to the core. The moment I saw Christina's image felt like eternity. A thought flashed through my mind. How? Why? How could she be connected to my killer? My hands trembled as I tried to make sense of what I saw. All my previous assumptions crumbled to dust. Before me stood a new darker enigma. The rest of the day passed in a haze. I mechanically performed my work duties but my thoughts were far away. Everything around me seemed unreal, and only Christina's image on the screen of my laptop was an anchor, keeping me in this world. After discovering that Christina might be linked to my killer, I became obsessed with the need to know more. My interest in her morphed into a genuine obsession. I spent hours exploring every detail of her life through the AI trying to piece together a picture of her daily routine, her whereabouts, her habits. Queries to the AI became my routine. What's happening with Christina? Christina from afar. The responses I received were more like hints than clear information. Images of her car and house, though not detailed enough to pinpoint specific addresses or numbers, gave me a general idea. I saw the brown interior of her car littered with fast food wrappers and views of a semi-ruined building where I presumed she might be. Every image of Christina caught in the AI's lens seemed to say to me, I know you're watching me. Her gaze, full of anger and defiance, made me feel guilty. But despite that, I couldn't stop. Spying on Christina gave me something more than just information. It was access to her inner world, something very personal and forbidden that I had never experienced before. Deep down, I hoped to see Julie, to find out what was happening in my ex-girlfriend's life, how their relationship was developing, what had happened. This interest was a mixture of pain, curiosity, and an indescribable longing for the past that seemed to have gone forever. Days turned into weeks, and my obsession didn't wane. I gathered information bit by bit, trying to piece it together to understand where all these trails were leading. Christina's life, her connection to Julie, and the beast from my nightmares, all of it filled my thoughts, leaving no room for anything else. Penetrating into someone else's life through screens and digital traces, I found a strange satisfaction in observing Christina. My world, 
which had never been characterized by a bustling social life, suddenly filled with secrets and intrigues available to me at any moment. I knew more about Christina than I had ever known about anyone else. Honestly, I wasn't particularly popular at work, and even in high school, I was never the friend people confided in. But between Christina and me, there were no secrets. My knowledge of her was almost comprehensive. I knew which apps she preferred, which books she kept on her bedside table. I saw how she mindlessly scrolled through social media feeds before bed, how she carefully chose the shade of nail polish, preferring warm, gentle tones. Observing her smile in conversations with Julie was particularly painful and mesmerizing for me. This smile full of warmth and intimacy became a symbol of lost happiness for me. The arguments between Christina and Julie, which sometimes slipped into their communication, gave me hope that their relationship wasn't as strong as it seemed. But every time these moments were resolved, and I remained alone with my pain and envy. The nighttime hours when Christina sat in the darkness, staring into emptiness, seemed to me a reflection of her inner world. I imagined her contemplating her life, the choices that led her to this moment. It seemed to me that these moments of solitude and reflection brought her closer to me, despite the physical and emotional distance between us. Her behavior at work, her small rebellions against the rules and authority, her drive for advancement, even at the expense of minor deceptions, painted a picture of a woman willing to take risks for her ambitions. All of this I knew, observing her through countless digital windows opened before me by the AI. But along with this knowledge came the realization that Christina sensed my unseen presence. Her solitude, her nightly vigils became more frequent. Her gaze when she accidentally met the camera seemed full of awareness. Are you still watching? This gaze seemed to say. My intrusion into her life, though carried out through the impersonal interface of the AI, began to affect her. Christina became more withdrawn, her life filled with a shadow that, as it seemed to me, I brought there. She looked increasingly mysterious, more contemplative, more dangerous. My professional life began to unravel at the seams. My obsession with Christina distracted me so much that I became noticeably scattered at work. Project deadlines became something vague and unattainable for me, resulting in my boss resorting to fines and unrestrained reprimands regularly. His dissatisfaction with me became part of my daily routine, like a curse from which there was no escape. With each passing day, my dependence on checking up on Christina through the AI intensified. If I didn't update the information about her every hour, I was gripped by cold sweat from the realization that I might miss some important moment. During the loading of each new image, I involuntarily bit my lips in anticipation, fearing that in the next shot, I would see Christina slowly approaching my home or workplace with a gleaming knife or gun in her hands. Maybe that beast would be with her. In this state of constant anxiety and guilt, I found myself in a car speeding through the nocturnal city. Barry, my only link to reality at that moment, tried to comfort me after another alcohol-soaked evening at the bar. Sitting in the passenger seat of his battered car, I felt shattered. The nausea from alcohol mixed with the internal discomfort from my recent actions and observations. Thoughts of Christina didn't leave me even in this state. It seemed to me that every moment spent away from the monitor increased the risk of missing something crucial. It was like a vicious circle with no way out. The more I learned, the stronger the need for new data became, and the more I lost myself. Pushed out of the car at my own doorstep, I felt the cold evening air wash over my face. Barry and his girlfriend had already disappeared around the corner, leaving me alone in the silence of the night. Trying to focus, 
I groped for my keys and was on the verge of entering my house when suddenly my attention was drawn to the inscription on the opposite wall, illuminated by a street lamp. In red paint, bright and provocative letters spelled out, Leave me alone. My heart skipped a beat. There was no doubt about who this message was from. With a sense of unease, I burst into the house, not even bothering to take off my jacket and rush to the laptop. I needed to know what Christina was doing this evening. The query I entered seemed to me the most important of all the time I had been observing her. The minutes of waiting stretched into eternity until the image appeared on the screen. Christina near my house. She is very angry, her hands covered in paint. Seeing this image dispelled the last remnants of alcohol-induced intoxication, leaving me sober and deeply frightened. She was here. But how did she know? This question circled in my mind, along with the thought that now I was not just an observer, but also a target. My safety seemed to be under threat. What would Christina do next, knowing that she was being watched? My imagination painted the darkest pictures. The fear that had previously been only the shadowy companion of my curiosity now stood before me in all its menacing reality. I realized that my actions, my constant surveillance of Christina, had crossed a line, and now I found myself trapped in my own game. Days passed, filled with silent struggles with myself. Days when I tried to justify my obsession with Christina. Deep down, I knew that I was responsible for her condition. The thought that my obsession might have driven her to the brink of despair haunted me. But the dark allure of the laptop screen, its black mirror, seemed to promise me comfort. The opportunity to reassure myself once again that I was safe. Just one look won't hurt, I persuaded myself sitting in front of the closed laptop. These words became my justification, my weak shield against the guilt I felt. And now, with a heavy heart and trembling hands, I opened the chat with the AI and entered the query. Christina, view from a hidden place. The minutes of waiting seemed like an eternity, each second filled with anxiety and fear. And when the images finally appeared on the screen, I felt the world around me collapse. The view of the room through the ceiling ventilation, on the floor of which words were painted, creating a sense of inevitability and horror. The words, it seemed, were written in blood or something even darker. Now I see you too. Christina was looking directly into the ventilation shaft, her face contorted with a mad grin teeth gleaming in the dim light. That gaze, full of challenge and madness, pierced me through. I understood that she knew. She knew about my weakness, about my fear. Quickly closing the laptop, I looked around, feeling the air in the room grow denser, heavier. The alcohol haze in my head dissipated instantly, leaving behind only the sober realization of the threat. I realized that the game had changed now. My safety, my world, my life, all of it suddenly seemed in question. Sitting in the darkness of my room, I tried to gather my thoughts, tried to find a way out. Every rustle outside the window, every creak of the floor sounded like the approach of the inevitable. My obsession with Christina had turned into her obsession with me. Several more tense days passed, during this time, the world around me seemed distorted through the lens of my fears. I began to notice vague figures lurking in the shadows of the evening streets as I returned home from work. Silhouettes outside the window, fleeting within my field of vision as I tried to find solitude in my own home. This feeling of all-seeing eyes became a constant source of fear for me. Paranoia consumed me entirely. I felt every rustle behind my back spoke of the approaching inevitable. But at the same time, deep inside, I knew I couldn't continue living like this. I knew I had to do something to put an end to this madness. But fear paralyzed me, 
preventing me from acting. Finally, unable to endure this internal conflict any longer, I resolved to take decisive action. With difficulty trying to suppress the internal resistance, I opened the laptop. My hands trembled as I entered the query, which I hoped would dispel my fears. Show my killer, view from a hidden place. This time I was searching not for Christina, but for my potential killer. I knew she would be with them. My heart pounded in my chest as I waited for a response, and when the image of my street appeared on the screen, my fear only intensified. I saw two small figures, under the dim light of the street lamps, slowly walking along the deserted sidewalk towards my house. The next query, show the face of the killer, was made automatically, as if I were no longer in control of my actions. And there they were, the faces of Julie and Christina across from my house. I couldn't believe my eyes. What awaits me? This question seemed to be the last one I could ask the AI. The AI's response surpassed my worst fears. The images, too vivid and detailed, presented me with a scenario I had refused to accept. A series of images depicted Julie and Christina approaching my home step by step. Suddenly, Christina stopped and said something to Julie, causing the latter to change in an incredible way. I observed as Julie, as if obeying some unknown force, shed her clothes and transformed into a beast, into the very beast depicted in the very first picture. I was captivated by this spectacle, watching Christina observe as Julie, altered by some witchcraft, broke into my home. It was more than just fear of physical threat. It was a sense of complete helplessness and the realization that I was doomed. Understanding always comes too late. This thought flickered in my consciousness like an elusive phantom as I sat in the darkened room, staring at the black screen of the laptop. Around me there was deep darkness, diluted only by drafts of cold wind, penetrating through the cracks in the old windows. I had created this situation myself. With every query entered into the AI, with every desire to know more, I stabbed myself in the back, leaving no chance for salvation. My fate was sealed the moment I first asked the artificial intelligence to show me the face of my killer. Now, as I felt the hunt closing in on me, understanding came too late. Sitting in the darkness, I pondered my options. Could I escape? No, they were already here. Could I call for help? Who would believe the madness of my story? The only choice remaining was to stand my ground, to stand against my fears, to stand against those who had come for me. I see their silhouettes at the window. They stand there, on the street, discussing their sinister plan. Christina whispers something to Julie, and Julie nods in response, holding something in her hands. I reach for my gun, an old but reliable tool of my salvation. This is my last chance. My heart beats in unison with each step they take closer to the house. I take aim through the window, my breath held, my hands trembling with tension and fear. A gunshot shatters the silence of the night. Julie falls, an ordinary gray stone slipping from her hands. Christina, shocked, screams in panic, falling to her knees beside Julie. I cannot stop. My second shot is aimed at Christina. It's over. I am saved. My hands tremble with the realization of what I have done, but deep down, I know. It was necessary. However, the moment of joy, triumph, and relief is instantly replaced by cold horror as my eyes fall on the laptop screen. There, a gruesome smiley flashes and a single word displayed in red letters joke. The final sinister message from the AI. Story 3 The morning I crossed into Silent Pines National Park, dawn broke with an unusual clarity. The sun, just lifting above the horizon, spilled light across the ground, revealing the park in the grip of winter's end. 
It felt like waking from a dream into another, where the chill in the air hinted at lingering secrets. I'd traveled a long way, both in distance and dreams, to stand here. As a kid, I'd lived in books of wilderness and myth, always imagining myself in the heart of untold adventures. Now, as I stepped through the park's entrance, a newly minted ranger, those childhood fantasies felt like they were merging with reality. The sign at the entrance, Silent Pines National Park, was simple, carved into wood that had weathered countless seasons. Beyond it, the gravel road snaked deeper into the forest, flanked by the towering presence of trees that felt ancient. I took a deep breath, the air crisp, filled with the scent of pine and a hint of snow. It was a smell that whispered of deep forests and untold stories. Driving along, I was captivated by the light filtering through the dense branches, creating patterns on the ground that shifted with the wind. It was beautiful, almost mesmerizing, a display of natural artistry that bordered on the spiritual. I felt an immediate deep connection to the land, a sense of belonging that had eluded me until now. My first weeks were dedicated to learning the park, its trails, its inhabitants. I walked the paths, absorbing the silence, the beauty of the snow-draped pines, the clear streams cutting through the landscape, and the valleys hidden from time. The deer, the squirrels, even the occasional fox or raccoon added life to the stillness, each sighting a quiet thrill. Despite the beauty and serenity of the park, there was something more to it. It was the mystery of the wilderness that attracted me to the role of a ranger. I began to delve into the history of Silent Pines, studying old maps and records, talking with local residents living on the outskirts of the park. They talked about this land with reverence, sharing stories about ancient spirits and legends of the forest. My curiosity was piqued by stories about the times when the park was considered the domain of creatures from myths and legends. Although I was skeptical about these stories, I could not deny the attraction of the unknown, the charm of secrets waiting to be revealed. And it was during one of my early morning patrols, when the first rays of dawn colored the sky in pink and gold tones, that I came across the first sign that something unusual was really hidden in the forest. I had set out at dawn, the air fresh with the scent of pine and the earthy aroma of the forest floor, still damp from the night's chill. My route took me through a section of the park less frequented by visitors, a dense thicket that bordered one of the many streams that crisscrossed the land. As I approached the stream, the sound of running water mingling with the morning calls of birds, I noticed something unusual. At the water's edge, partially hidden by a clump of ferns, lay the body of a deer. From a distance, it appeared as though the animal might be resting. But as I drew closer, the true nature of the scene before me became apparent. The deer had been brutally attacked its injuries severe and unlike any predator attack I had encountered before in my career. The precision of the wounds suggested intelligence, a disturbing thought that sent a shiver down my spine. I knelt beside the animal, my mind racing with questions. What kind of creature could have done this? And why did it feel like this was more than a simple act of predation? Determined to find answers, I documented the scene with meticulous care, taking photographs and notes that I hoped might later offer some insight. The rest of my patrol passed in a haze of contemplation, the beauty of the park now shadowed by the violence of what I had found. Back at the ranger station, I shared my findings with the team, expecting concern, perhaps even a sense of urgency. To my surprise, the reaction was muted, Seasoned rangers spoke of the occasional rogue predator, suggesting a bear or a mountain lion might be responsible. Despite their reassurances, 
I couldn't shake the feeling that what I had witnessed was something entirely different. In the days that followed, my patrols were marked by a heightened sense of vigilance. I found myself scanning the underbrush, listening for any sound out of place, the weight of uncertainty a constant companion. It wasn't long before I discovered another victim, this time a raccoon, its condition mirroring that of the deer in its violence. The pattern of attacks, growing in frequency and brutality, became impossible to ignore. Each discovery added to a growing dossier of incidents that seemed to point to a predator unlike any Silent Pines had known. Conversations with my fellow rangers became a study in frustration. Where I saw a mystery that needed solving, they saw only the harsh realities of nature. Feeling increasingly isolated in my concern, I turned to the park's extensive library of wildlife reports and research, hoping to find anything that might shed light on the situation. Nights stretched long as I pored over documents, the glow of my desk lamp a solitary beacon in the dark. It was during one of these late-night sessions that Sarah found me, her presence a welcome interruption to the solitary task. A botanist with an uncanny ability to read the language of the forest, she had noticed the same unease that had taken root in my thoughts. Still chasing shadows, Mark? she asked, her voice tinged with a mix of concern and curiosity. I'm not sure what I'm chasing, I admitted gesturing to the scattered reports on my desk. But there's something out there, something that doesn't fit with any patterns we know. Sarah pulled up a chair. Her interest peaked. Together we revisited the evidence, the photographs and notes, painting a grim picture of the unknown threat. It was Sarah who first suggested we look beyond the conventional explanations to consider the possibility of something more. Have you ever heard the old stories? She asked, her voice lowering as if to keep the secrets of the park. Legends of creatures that roam these lands, guardians of the forest or spirits of the wild. I had of course heard snippets of folklore, tales told around campfires to spook the unwary. But to consider them as anything more than stories felt like a leap into the absurd. Yet faced with the inexplicable, the idea of looking to the past for answers held a certain appeal. Our conversation stretched into the early hours, theories forming and dissolving in the shared pursuit of understanding. It was a partnership born of necessity, a mutual recognition that the mystery of the attacks was something neither of us could solve alone. After discovering evidence of unusual attacks in Silent Pines, Sarah and I knew we had to delve deeper into the park's mysteries. The early stories about creatures of legend now seemed more relevant than ever. Our plan was to gather as much information as possible, both from the park's archives and from any locals with knowledge of its deeper secrets. We dedicated several days to researching at the local library, hoping to find historical records or personal accounts that might shed light on the recent incidents. The library, located near the park's administrative office, became our temporary base of operations. There, amidst rows of aging books and dusty shelves, we found old newspaper clippings and ranger logs that documented past encounters with wildlife and detailed the geography of the park's more remote areas. One particular log, dating back over 50 years, caught our attention. It contained detailed notes from a ranger who had reported seeing shadows that moved with purpose, far from any known animal paths. These shadows, the ranger speculated, might be guardians of the forest, a theory that seemed to align with the stories we had heard. With this new information, we plotted out the locations of the recent attacks on a map of silent pines. A pattern emerged suggesting that these incidents were concentrated in a specific area of the park. This area was known for its dense forests and rugged terrain, making it less accessible and rarely visited by hikers. Determined to explore this area ourselves, 
we prepared for an overnight expedition. We packed our gear carefully, including cameras, flashlights, and enough supplies to last us through the night. Our goal was to observe any unusual activity and, if possible, gather evidence that could explain what was happening in Silent Pines. The expedition led us deep into the heart of the park. As we hiked, the familiar sounds of the forest accompanied us, but there was an undercurrent of tension, knowing that we might be close to uncovering something extraordinary. Night fell, and the forest transformed. The sounds of nocturnal creatures filled the air, a reminder that we were not alone. Hours passed without any sign of the mysterious shadows mentioned in the ranger's log. Just when it seemed our search might be in vain, we heard a rustling in the underbrush near our campsite. Grabbing our flashlights, we scanned the area. For a moment there was nothing but the dense foliage and the night. Then we saw it, a pair of reflective eyes watching us from the darkness. We held our breath hoping for a closer look. But the creature vanished as quickly as it had appeared. Though we didn't get the evidence we had hoped for, the encounter was a confirmation that there was something out there. Something that wasn't just an ordinary predator. We returned to the ranger station the next day with more questions than answers, but resolved to continue our investigation. In the following weeks, Sarah and I went through every piece of information we could find, piecing together the history of Silent Pines and its legends. We interviewed longtime residents, combed through archival materials, and spent countless hours in the field, trying to connect the dots. The northern woods of Silent Pines were a world apart, a vast expanse of wilderness that stretched beyond the horizon, untouched and untamed. This part of the park was seldom visited by campers or hikers, its dense foliage and rugged terrain deterring all but the most adventurous or foolhardy. It was here, amid the ancient trees and whispering winds, that I sought answers to the mystery that had gripped the park. The day began with the first light of dawn, the sun casting a golden glow through the towering pines their shadows long and foreboding on the forest floor. I had packed the essentials, water, food, a first aid kit, and most importantly, my camera and notebook. The latter had become my constant companions, tools in my quest to unravel the truth behind the brutal attacks that had unsettled the peace of Silent Pines. As I ventured deeper into the northern sector, the signs of human presence faded away replaced by the untamed beauty of nature. The path, barely visible under the thick underbrush, wound its way through the heart of the forest. Every step took me further from the world I knew, deeper into a realm where the rules of man had no dominion. The air was cool, filled with the scent of pine and the earthy aroma of the forest floor. Birdsong filled the air, a melodic counterpoint to the crunch of my boots on the path. Despite the beauty of the scene, a sense of unease settled over me, a palpable tension that seemed to emanate from the trees themselves. It was as if the forest was watching, waiting. I had been walking for several hours when I first noticed the signs. It began with a subtle shift in the air, a sudden silence that fell over the forest. The birds had stopped singing, the gentle rustle of leaves and branches ceasing as if nature itself had paused to draw a breath. Then came the tracks, unlike any I had seen before. They were fresh, the imprints clear in the soft earth of the path, too large for a deer, too irregular for a bear. The realization sent a chill down my spine. I was not alone. Something was out there, something large and... If the stories were to be believed, dangerous. With a mixture of trepidation and determination, I followed the tracks, my camera at the ready. They led me off the path, through a thicket of brambles that scratched at my arms and face, drawing blood. But the pain was a distant concern, 
my focus fixed on the trail before me. The tracks led to a clearing, a natural hollow surrounded by dense trees. The sunlight filtered through the canopy above, casting dappled shadows on the ground. And there, at the far end of the clearing, was the den. It was a crude structure, built against the base of a large boulder. Branches and foliage had been artfully arranged to conceal the entrance, the work of intelligent hands. My heart raced as I approached, every instinct screaming at me to turn back. But I couldn't. I needed to know. The entrance to the den was low, forcing me to crouch as I peered inside. The interior was dark, the air cool and damp. I could see the outlines of a makeshift bed, a pile of leaves and moss in one corner. Scattered around were the remnants of meals past, bones picked clean of meat, some unmistakably human. I took a step back, my mind reeling from the implications. This was no bear's den. The intelligence behind its construction, the evidence of its inhabitants' diet, all pointed to one conclusion. The legends were true. Silent Pines was home to something far more sinister than any natural predator. The sound of a branch snapping behind me shattered the silence, my heart leaping into my throat. I spun around, camera raised, only to find myself alone. The forest had reclaimed its stillness, the momentary panic fading as the realization set in. I had found what I was looking for, but now the hunt was on in earnest. Whatever called this den home, it was smart, elusive, and most importantly, it was watching me. Determined to seek answers, I equipped myself with more than just the essentials for survival and observation. I carried a digital recorder, hoping to capture any sounds or evidence, and a night vision camera to pierce the darkness that shrouded the forest at night. My goal was clear, to observe and document, not to confront. The following weeks were marked by a meticulous pattern of tracking and waiting. I mapped out the areas around the den, setting up motion-sensitive cameras at strategic points. Each evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, I would settle into my hiding spot, a camouflaged tent set up at a safe distance from the clearing. The waiting was a test of patience and resolve. The forest, a cacophony of sounds that played tricks on my mind. One night, under the cloak of a new moon, the forest fell eerily silent. It was a silence that preceded something momentous. Peering through my binoculars, I scanned the clearing, my breath caught in anticipation. That's when I saw it, a figure emerging from the shadows, its movements graceful yet deliberate. It was unlike anything I had ever seen. Standing on two legs, its form was shrouded in the darkness, but the outline was unmistakable. A creature of substantial size, its features humanoid, yet distinctly animalistic. My hand trembled as I lifted the night vision camera, recording the moment with a sense of awe and fear. The creature paused at the edge of the clearing, tilting its head as if sensing my presence. My heart pounded in my chest, the realization dawning on me that I was no longer the observer, but the observed. The roles had reversed, and I was now the intruder in its domain. For long minutes, we remained in a standoff, neither of us moving. Then, with a grace that belied its size, the creature turned and disappeared into the forest. The encounter lasted only minutes, but it felt like an eternity. I was left with a recording that would change everything, tangible proof of the unbelievable. The moment of truth came with a disheartening revelation. When I eagerly watched the footage from the cameras, the screen came to life, but only to display static or, worse, completely blank images. Hours of footage, or what should have been hours of footage, captured nothing but the empty, undisturbed forest night after night. It was a setback I hadn't anticipated. The technology I'd relied on, which I had hoped would unveil the secrets of Silent Pines, had failed me at the crucial moment. The creature, with its unnerving intelligence, had either avoided the cameras altogether 
or, I feared, somehow disabled them. The frustration was palpable, a bitter pill swallowed in the silence of the ranger station. Sarah, ever the voice of reason, suggested interference or a technical glitch could be to blame. But deep down, I knew it was more than mere coincidence or failure of equipment. It was as if the forest itself conspired to keep its secrets, protecting the mystery that lay within its heart. Determined not to be deterred, I resolved to return to the forest. This time, I would not rely on cameras or remote sensors. I needed to witness the creature again, to gather evidence with my own eyes and ears. It was a daunting task, the thought of venturing back into the domain of such a formidable presence. Yet, the need for answers, for understanding, outweighed the fear and uncertainty. Preparations for the second expedition were made with careful consideration. I packed lightly, opting for mobility over comfort. A high-definition camera, its memory wiped clean and battery fully charged, would be my only companion, alongside a handheld recorder and a powerful flashlight. This time, I would venture deeper into the forest, beyond the den, into the areas where the attacks had been most frequent. The journey back into the wilderness of silent pines was marked by a sense of déjà vu, the familiar paths and landmarks greeting me like old adversaries. The air, however, carried a different charge, a tension that seemed to whisper of unseen watchers and hidden dangers. I pushed forward, driven by a mix of determination and the adrenaline of the hunt. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows that danced between the ancient trees, I felt the isolation of the forest more acutely than ever. The beauty of silent pines, with its towering pines and undisturbed clearings, took on a more sinister aspect as dusk approached. Every rustle in the underbrush, every snap of a twig underfoot, heightened the anticipation of what lay ahead. Nightfall enveloped the forest in darkness, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the blackness like a beacon. The deeper I ventured, the more the forest seemed to close in around me, the silence punctuated by the occasional distant howl or the eerie hoot of an owl. Then, just as the weight of the night began to press down upon me, I saw it, a fleeting shadow moving with purpose through the trees. I raised my camera, the infrared mode cutting through the darkness, and followed. The chase was on, a game of cat and mouse through the dense forest, each step taking me further from safety and deeper into the unknown. The creature moved with a grace that belied its size, its path leading me to a part of the park I had never ventured into before. The terrain became rougher, the vegetation denser, until at last I found myself at the edge of a clearing I had never seen on any map. And there, in the center of the clearing, illuminated by the moonlight that filtered through the canopy above, I saw them, not one, but a group of creatures gathered as if in council. They were like the one I had encountered before, but varied in size and features, a family united in the moonlit glade. I dared not move, barely breathed, as I recorded the scene before me. It was a moment of revelation, the discovery of a lifetime. These were the guardians of silent pines, the beings of legend made flesh. In their presence, I felt an overwhelming sense of awe and a profound realization of the true nature of the wilderness. The recording continued, every detail captured in the silent vigil of the night. This time, there would be no malfunction, no failure. The evidence was irrefutable, a testament to the mysteries that lay hidden in the heart of silent pines. As the creatures eventually dispersed, melting back into the forest from which they had come, I remained. The first light of dawn found me still in the clearing, the camera's memory full, my own mind overflowing with wonder and questions. The journey back to the ranger station was a blur, my steps hastened by the urgency of my discovery. The footage I had captured would change everything, challenging our understanding of the natural world and our place within it. 
but as I emerged from the forest, the first rays of the sun warming the chill of the night from my bones, I realized that some mysteries were not meant to be solved. Silent Pines had revealed its secret to me, not as a challenge to be conquered, but as a trust to be kept. In the days that followed, Sarah and I watched the footage in silence, the images on the screen speaking more eloquently than words ever could. We knew that what we had witnessed was a gift, a glimpse into a world that existed alongside our own, yet apart. The decision was made without the need for discussion. The footage will remain confidential, a secret. I decided to delete everything. Silent Pines would continue to be a sanctuary, its mysteries preserved for generations to come. As for me, my journey had come full circle. The child who had dreamed of adventures in the wild had found his adventure, not in the pages of a book, but in the living, breathing heart of the forest. Silent Pines had become not just a place of duty, but a home, a part of my soul where the legends of old danced among the shadows, guardians of a world that remained wild, free, and undisturbed. Story 4 I write this letter with trembling hands, my nerves frayed. The pen in my grip feels heavy, almost foreign, as if I'm not just writing, but etching my very soul onto these pages. I can't believe what I'm about to tell you is real. Maybe I'm crazy. But when they tried to diagnose me, all they did was shake their heads, advising me to stop talking nonsense and try to cope with my violent fantasy. It all started six months ago, a time when life seemed simple, my days filled with the mundane yet comforting routine of a high school senior. I was studying hard for the SAT. The pages of my textbooks often blurred into a dance of numbers and words as I pushed myself into the late hours of the night. The silence of my room, punctuated only by the soft ticking of the clock and the occasional turn of a page, was a sanctuary of sorts. My participation in extracurricular and social activities was not just a pursuit of interest, but a meticulously planned strategy. Sports, volunteer work, school clubs, you name it, I was there. Each activity was a carefully placed piece in the puzzle of my resume, all for one single goal, to get accepted by a prestigious university. Life was good, in a predictable, comfortable way. I had a happy family. My parents, always supportive, often worried about me overworking myself, but proud nonetheless. My younger sister, with her endless chatter about school dramas, provided a much needed distraction from my own stress. And then there was my small group of friends, a tight-knit circle who valued my opinions and showed genuine love and support. We were a band of dreamers, each chasing our own version of the future. It was a time of ambition, a time when my peers and I were desperately trying to make up for lost time in everything. Be it studies or a failed romance, there was a palpable sense of urgency in the air, a collective scramble to seize every opportunity, to right every wrong. The school year was in full swing, a routine of classes, homework, and the occasional high school drama firmly established when she arrived. Her name was Isabella, and from the moment she stepped into the school, she was unlike anyone we had ever seen. Isabella had an air about her that was at once captivating and disconcerting. She was undeniably beautiful, with long, dark brown hair that fell in light waves around her shoulders framing her face in a way that seemed almost deliberate, as if each strand was carefully placed to enhance her mysterious allure. When she moved, her hair caught the light, shimmering with fires of hues, like sunlight dancing on a calm sea. Her eyes were large and honey-colored, framed by thick black lashes that gave her gaze a depth that was hard to decipher. It was as if her eyes held secrets, Stories untold that beckoned you closer, even as they warned you to keep your distance. Her skin was olive-toned, 
glowing with a golden hue under the rays of the sun, and her lips were lush and red, often curved in a knowing smile that hinted at an inner amusement. Her style of dress was as distinctive as her appearance. She always dressed brightly, favoring colors that seemed to enhance her natural radiance. Wherever she went, she attracted attention, turning heads and drawing whispers. I remember the day she first walked into our classroom. The sun was streaming through the windows, casting patterns of light and shadow across the desks. The teacher introduced her as Isabella, and as she looked around the room, her gaze lingered on each of us for a moment, as if committing our faces to memory. I liked her immediately, though I couldn't have explained why. One day I walked past her locker and saw her opening it. The way she did it was oddly fascinating, deliberate and graceful, as if even this simple act was part of a larger, unseen dance. She noticed me watching her and smiled. As the weeks passed, I couldn't help but notice that among all my friends, it was me who seemed to hold Isabella's attention the most. She often sought me out, her honey-colored eyes lingering on me during our conversations. Despite this, we never progressed beyond the bounds of friendly chats. My commitment to Nancy, my girlfriend, was a line I wasn't willing to cross. Nancy, with her easy smile and no-nonsense attitude, had been a steady presence in my life for over a year. Our relationship was comfortable, familiar. A month into Isabella's arrival, the initial buzz that surrounded her began to fade. The novelty of the new mysterious girl wore off, and she gradually became just another student in the crowded hallways of our school. Still, her beauty and aura of mystery kept her at the center of attention, particularly among the boys. I watched as various guys tried their luck, approaching Isabella with clumsy attempts at charm. They offered her gifts, flowers, chocolates, even a few love letters that looked more like essays. But Isabella turned them all down, her rejections polite yet firm. It seemed she wasn't interested in dating, or perhaps she hadn't found anyone who caught her interest. Instead, Isabella threw herself into her studies with a fervor that was almost alarming. I would often see her in the library, her head buried in books that ranged from classic literature to advanced physics. She had a hunger for knowledge that was insatiable devouring information with an intensity that was both impressive and slightly unnerving. As days turned into weeks, I began to notice a shift in Isabella's behavior towards me. She had a way of sitting close, close enough that I could catch the subtle scent of her perfume, a faint aroma that reminded me of old books and autumn leaves. In class, her presence became more pronounced her gaze often resting on me for longer than was comfortable. I caught her several times sketching in her notebook, and one day, driven by curiosity, I managed to glance at her drawings. To my surprise, I found myself staring back from the pages. It was flattering and unsettling in equal measure. I wasn't exactly a stranger to attention. Without sounding conceited, I was well known in school, a combination of decent academic performance, a spot on the varsity football team, and a generally sociable demeanor made me fairly popular. My appearance, which I'd always taken a casual pride in, now seemed to serve as a point of fascination for Isabella. But as I sit here, scribbling down these memories, that version of me seems like a distant echo. The reflection that stares back at me now from the mirror is a shadow of that former self. Dark circles under hollow eyes, a gaunt face, and hands that tremble with an unrelenting mix of fear and malnutrition. But let's return to the story, to those days that now seem so innocuously serene in hindsight. Isabella's interest in me was a topic of mild amusement among my friends. They'd nudge me with knowing looks, teasingly suggesting there was more to her attention than mere artistic appreciation. Nancy, on the other hand, didn't find it amusing. 
Her smiles became less frequent, replaced by a tight-lipped concern. Our conversations often circled back to Isabella. Nancy's words tinged with an edge of jealousy and worry. The day I saw Isabella painting my face with such vigor, I felt curious. Her focus on the sketch was so fervent, it seemed as if she was trying to capture something more than just my physical likeness. After class, driven by a blend of curiosity and vanity, I approached her. She looked up, her honey-colored eyes meeting mine, and with a gentle smile she carefully tore out the sheet of paper and handed it to me. I expected her to wait, to watch my reaction, but she simply gathered her things and left the class, her steps light and graceful. Holding the drawing, I was struck by the meticulous detail. It was more than a mere sketch. It was as if a part of me had been transferred onto the paper. Every line, every contour of my face was captured with an almost eerie precision. It was beautiful and unsettling in equal measure. Later that day, I saw her again, standing by the school gates. She appeared to be waiting for something, or someone. As our eyes met, there was an unspoken acknowledgement, a connection that went beyond words. I walked over, the drawing still in my hand. Thank you, Isabella. I really enjoyed it, I said, trying to convey my appreciation. Her smile widened, a glint of something unidentifiable in her eyes. Shall we go for a walk together? She asked, her voice tinged with hopeful anticipation. We spent the next half hour wandering the streets near the school. The conversation was surprisingly easy, Isabella speaking with a fluidity that was captivating. She told me about the places she had lived before moving here, painting vivid pictures of distant towns and cities. She spoke of her relatives in a detached manner, mentioning them more as characters in a story rather than people she was connected to. As we were about to part ways, she turned to me with a question that took me by surprise. Can I paint you on a good canvas? Her voice was earnest, her gaze intense. The proposal was unexpected, but I found myself agreeing without much hesitation. The idea of being immortalized in a painting by someone as talented as Isabella was flattering, and I was curious to see how she would translate my likeness into a larger, more permanent medium. The following days were marked by a sense of anticipation. I found myself distracted, my thoughts often drifting to Isabella and the upcoming portrait session. Nancy noticed the change in me, her expressions fluctuating between concern and annoyance. Our conversations grew more strained, the unspoken tension between us thickening like fog. When the day finally came for Isabella to paint my portrait, I felt a mix of excitement and nervousness. She had asked me to meet her at her house, a quaint old building that stood at the edge of town. The house had an air of neglect about it, the paint peeling in places, the garden overgrown. But there was a charm to it, a sense of history that was almost palpable. Isabella greeted me at the door, her smile warm yet enigmatic. She led me to a room that she had converted into a studio. The space was filled with canvases, some blank, some adorned with hauntingly beautiful paintings. The light filtered in through the dusty windows, casting a soft glow on the array of brushes and paints that lay neatly arranged on a table. Isabella's demeanor as she painted was focused, almost trance-like. When she finally stepped back, signaling that the session was over, I felt a rush of relief. I was eager to see the painting to see how she had captured me, but Isabella covered it with a cloth before I could get a glimpse. It's not ready yet, she said, her voice distant. You'll see it when it's finished. I must confess, there was an undeniable pull towards Isabella, a gravitational force that seemed to draw me into her orbit with each passing day. We continued to spend time together after school, our conversations meandering through a myriad of topics from the mundane to the profound. There was an ease in our interactions, 
a comfort in the way our thoughts and words intertwined. However, there was Nancy. She had been a constant in my life, a grounding presence amidst the whirlwinds of teenage drama. But as my connection with Isabella deepened, so too did the rift between Nancy and me. The day she confronted me about my time with Isabella was inevitable. I remember it vividly. The accusation in her eyes, the quiver in her voice that spoke of hurt and betrayal. Nancy's reaction was explosive, a mixture of anger, jealousy, and tears. Despite my assurances that Isabella and I were just friends, she saw through the thin veil of my half-truths. Deep down, I knew Nancy was right. My feelings for Isabella had transcended the bounds of mere friendship. It was my fault that things had come to this point. I could have set clear boundaries with Isabella from the start, could have maintained a respectful distance, but the truth was, I didn't want to. Confronted with Nancy's ultimatum, I was torn. Part of me rebelled at the idea of cutting Isabella out of my life, yet I couldn't bear the thought of losing Nancy. After a long, sleepless night wrestling with my conscience, I made a decision. I would do as Nancy asked, as I had promised. I would stop all communication with Isabella. The following day was heavy with unspoken words and lingering glances. When I saw Isabella, her eyes searched mine, a question unasked yet clearly understood. I avoided her, each step away from her feeling like a betrayal of what I truly wanted. But I had made a promise to Nancy, and I intended to keep it. The day I noticed Isabella's gaze had changed, transformed from curiosity and affection into something colder, more resentful, it unsettled me. Her eyes, once warm and inviting, now seemed to bore into me with a sharpness that felt almost tangible. I hadn't expected to confront her after school, but as fate would have it, our paths crossed. The schoolyard was nearly empty, the late afternoon sun casting long shadows across the concrete. As I approached her, I could feel the weight of the moment the inevitable confrontation that loomed between us. I thought you liked me, Isabella said, her voice tinged with a hurt that seemed to go deeper than mere disappointment. That something was possible between us. Why did you give me hope? Her words struck a chord in me, guilt and confusion intertwining in a tight knot. Before I could respond, she continued, her voice dropping to a whisper that carried an intensity I had never heard from her before. I want to say something. I love you. Be with me, or else I will make it so. She trailed off, but the implication was clear. It sounded like a threat, veiled but unmistakable. At the time, I didn't take it seriously, but a part of me was unnerved by the intensity in her eyes. In a mix of annoyance and bewilderment, I replied, I didn't mean to give you any reason. I was just talking to you as a friend. You knew I had a sweetheart, my Nancy. If you thought I gave you an excuse, I'm sorry it wasn't like that. Confusion reigned in my mind. I had never been in such a contradictory situation before. My words, meant to be conciliatory, seemed to have the opposite effect. I watched as Isabella's face contorted with anger and hatred, her features momentarily twisting into something vile and repulsive. A shiver of horror ran down my spine at the sight. With a soft, almost sinister smirk, she said, You'll be sorry, and then turned, walking away with a grace that belied the malice in her words. I stood there, frozen as the chill of the evening air began to seep into my bones. Walking home, I replayed the conversation in my head, each word echoing with a foreboding I couldn't shake. The image of Isabella's distorted face haunted me, a glimpse into a side of her I hadn't known existed. The streets were quiet, the rhythmic sound of my footsteps a lonely accompaniment to my troubled thoughts. 
Arriving home, I found no relief. The house was empty, my parents still at work, and the silence felt oppressive. I went to the kitchen, mechanically preparing a sandwich, but my appetite was gone. The food tasted like ash in my mouth. By the time evening rolled around, the events of the day with Isabella had receded to the back of my mind, leaving only a lingering bitterness. Wrapped comfortably in my blanket, I was on the cusp of sleep when a peculiar sound shattered the silence. A scratching, a persistent clawing was coming from the wall outside my bedroom window. The sound grew in intensity, morphing into a desperate scrabbling that sent shivers down my spine. In a sudden rush of fear, I bolted from my bed, my heart pounding in my ears. The hallway seemed longer than usual as I sprinted towards the safety of my parents' room. I burst in, panting, to find my mom reading at the table while my dad was just dozing off. Their surprised faces turned to amusement as I blurted out my story. They laughed, a light-hearted chuckle that stung me more than I cared to admit. You're such an adult, yet scared like a little kid, my mom teased. I could see they didn't believe me, brushing it off as an overactive imagination. Offended and frustrated, I left their room, my mind racing with unanswered questions and rising panic. What was I to do? Returning to my room was out of the question. The scratching sound still echoed in my mind, too real to be dismissed as mere fancy. In a moment of desperation, I grabbed my phone and dialed Nancy's number, seeking comfort and understanding. When Nancy answered, her voice was a balm to my frazzled nerves. I recounted my experience, expecting skepticism but hoping for support. To my surprise, she didn't laugh or dismiss my fears. Instead, there was a gravity in her tone that I had never heard before. She confessed that she had experienced something similar, a revelation that sent a fresh wave of terror through me. We agreed to meet at the vacant lot not far from my house, a neutral ground away from prying eyes and unsettling noises. Hurriedly, I dressed, my movements erratic, fueled by adrenaline and fear. I told my parents I was going for a walk with Nancy. Their response, a playful jibe about my being a little coward, did nothing to ease my apprehension. Don't stay out too long, my dad called out as I hurried out the door, his words tinged with paternal concern beneath the teasing. The night was darker than usual, the moon obscured by thick clouds, casting the world in murky shadows. The vacant lot was a five-minute walk from my house, but tonight it felt like an eternity. Every rustle of the wind, every creak of the branches, set my nerves on edge. The cold wind bit into my skin as I raced towards the vacant lot, my breath coming in ragged gasps. The night was oppressively dark. My heart pounded in my chest, a relentless drum echoing my fear. What I saw upon arriving at the lot froze me in my tracks, a scene straight out of a nightmare. Nancy lay on the ground, her body a broken, bleeding mess. Hovering over her was a creature, a grotesque parody of a dog. It was large, rat-like, with matted, frizzy hair that seemed to drip with some unidentifiable liquid. Its sharp teeth tore mercilessly at Nancy's face, ripping off her cheek with a sickening diligence. For a few agonizing moments, I was paralyzed, horror rooting me to the spot. The scene before me was too gruesome, too surreal to process. Then, my stomach revolted, a violent surge of nausea overwhelming me. I vomited uncontrollably, my body convulsed. As I fell to my knees, weak and trembling, the creature's red eyes snapped towards me. It was a gaze filled with malice, a malevolent intelligence that sent a chill slicing through my already frigid body. In that instant, I knew I had to act, to defend myself. With a desperate scramble, I grabbed a rock from the ground, its rough surface biting into my palm. 
I hurled it at the beast with all the strength I could muster. The creature, with an agility that belied its grotesque form, dodged the projectile easily. It snarled, a sound that was guttural and chilling, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. Panic took over, and I turned to run, but my foot caught on something unseen in the darkness. I stumbled, falling hard onto the unforgiving ground. Pain exploded in my head as it struck the earth, stars dancing before my eyes. I tried to rise, but a searing agony in my leg stopped me. The creature was upon me, its teeth sunk deep into my flesh. The pain was blinding, a white-hot intensity that obliterated all other sensations. I could feel the warm blood gushing from the wound, the creature's breath hot and foul against my skin. My screams tore through the night, a desperate plea for help that I knew would go unanswered. The last vestiges of consciousness slipped away from me, the world fading to black as the creature's jaws tightened their grip. I awoke to a world of sterile white, the sharp antiseptic smell of the hospital stinging my nostrils. My legs were swathed in bandages, a dull, throbbing pain pulsating through them. Above me, the ceiling tiles blurred into focus, each one a stark reminder of the grim reality I now faced. My mother was there, her chair pulled close to my bed. Her hand was clasped around mine, a lifeline in this sea of uncertainty. Her eyes, red-rimmed and weary, lit up with a mixture of relief and exhaustion when she saw me stir. Son, finally, she said, her voice a whisper of hope. Everyone already thought it would end badly for you. Are you feeling okay? Her words triggered a flood of memories, a torrent of horror that crashed over me with unrelenting force. The image of the creature, that monstrous parody of a dog feasting on Nancy, flashed in my mind. I let out a strangled cry, the sound of despair incarnate. What happened? Is Nancy all right? Tell me I dreamed the whole thing. My mother's face crumpled, her eyes lowering as she delivered the words that shattered my world. Nancy is gone, she murmured. She was attacked by some predatory animal. That's what the police said. They found you covered in blood, with bitten feet, but most importantly alive. The room seemed to spin, a carousel of pain and disbelief. I felt a piercing headache, the pain of physical manifestation of the horror that gripped my soul. In a voice barely above a whisper, I said, Mom, I saw everything. It was a dog, but it was unusual, like it was intelligent, you know. Her look, one of pity and disbelief, stung me. It was the gaze one gives to someone who has lost touch with reality, a look that labeled me as delusional. This infuriated me, the frustration and fear boiling over into rage. I'm telling the truth, I yelled. Why won't anyone believe me? At my outburst, a nurse hurried into the room, her face a mask of professional concern. She quickly assessed the situation, her movements practiced and efficient. I barely felt the prick of the needle as she administered the sedative, my consciousness already teetering on the edge. As the drug coursed through my veins, dulling the pain and pulling me down into a murky haze, I caught snippets of the nurse's conversation with my mother. He's delirious, she said in a soothing tone. It will pass. Those words echoed in my mind as I drifted off, a mantra of dismissal that sought to negate the horror I had witnessed. But deep down, I knew the truth. What I had seen, what I had experienced, was no delusion. The creature, that nightmarish beast, was real. In the deep embrace of night, I awoke to a world shrouded in darkness. The hospital room, illuminated only by the faint glow of the hallway light seeping under the door, felt claustrophobic, a cage of shadows. My heart raced, adrenaline coursing through my veins as my eyes adjusted to the dim light. There, 
In the darkness, two red eyes glowed ominously. My breath caught in my throat, terror gripping me with icy fingers. Then, a quiet voice broke the silence, a voice that sent shivers down my spine. It's me, Isabella. Her words were a cold whisper, a chilling wind that swept through the room. I told you that you would regret it, but I'm going to give you another chance. Be with me, and your family will not be harmed. What's your answer to that? I lay there, frozen in fear, my mind racing. This couldn't be real. It had to be a hallucination, a side effect of the medication. But the red glow of her eyes, the palpable sense of menace that filled the room, it was all too real. Who are you? What kind of monster are you? I managed to stammer, my voice trembling with dread. Isabella moved closer, her hand covering my mouth with an unnerving gentleness. We are called Nagual, she whispered. We are a race of humans, mages, shamans, werewolves, but no one will believe you. Her words hung in the air, a declaration of a reality too bizarre, too frightening to comprehend. My mind struggled to process the information, to make sense of the impossible. I'm going to leave now, and you think whether your family is dear to you. Think well, she said, her tone a mix of warning and enticement. As her hand stroked my face, a gesture that should have been comforting but was anything but... I felt an overwhelming sense of helplessness. Then, as silently as she had appeared, Isabella left the room, melting into the shadows like a ghost. I lay there, my heart pounding in my chest, trying to convince myself that it had been a dream, a figment of my imagination. But the cold touch of her hand on my face, the lingering sense of her presence, it was all too real. The room felt oppressive, the darkness a tangible presence that seemed to press down on me. I wanted to scream, to call for help, but fear held my voice captive. What could I say? Who would believe such an outlandish story? Nagual. The word echoed in my mind, a term from folklore and legend, now given terrifying substance. Mages, shamans, werewolves. The words were like pieces of a puzzle, falling into place to form a picture that was as fascinating as it was horrifying. I lay there for what felt like hours, my mind a whirlwind of thoughts and fears. The night seemed endless, a void in which time had ceased to exist. Every creak of the hospital, every rustle of the sheets, sent my heart racing, a constant reminder of the nightmare that had become my reality. The night stretched on endlessly, a tapestry of shadows and fears. Each creak and murmur of the hospital seemed to whisper Isabella's name, a relentless reminder of the terror that had infiltrated my life. Sleep was an elusive dream, its absence leaving me in a state of heightened anxiety, expecting at any moment to see those red eyes emerge from the darkness. As afternoon dawned, bringing with it the mundane rhythms of hospital life, my resolve hardened. I had to tell someone to share the unbelievable truth of what I had witnessed. The doctor, a middle-aged man with kind blue eyes and a reassuring demeanor, seemed like my best chance. But as I poured out my story, his expression shifted from concern to something akin to detached professionalism. My heart sank as he called in a psychiatrist. Their disbelief was a tangible thing, a wall of skepticism that I could not penetrate. They subjected me to a battery of tests, probing and questioning, but their conclusions were clear. I was adequate. My experiences dismissed as the desperate attempts of a traumatized mind to make sense of tragedy. The psychiatrist, with his practiced calm and analytical gaze, suggested that I was trying to rationalize the horrific events that had befallen Nancy and me. He spoke of grief, of shock, of the mind's ability to conjure fantastical explanations for the inexplicable. But his words felt like hollow echoes, 
meaningless in the face of the reality I had experienced. I was left alone, my story unbelieved, my fears unacknowledged. The sense of isolation was crushing, a weight that pressed down on me with every passing hour. In this sterile, indifferent environment, I felt like a ghost, unseen and unheard. As the day waned, a desperate plan began to form in my mind. I couldn't, wouldn't let Isabella win to bring harm to my family. I couldn't stand by and watch as my life and the lives of those I loved were destroyed by this malevolent force. In a moment of reckless determination, I managed to steal a bottle of strong tranquilizers from the nurse's station. My hands trembled as I clutched the small vial, the pills inside a promise of escape, of an end to the nightmare. I sat there on the edge of my hospital bed, the bottle in my hand. My thoughts were a chaotic swirl of fear, love, and resolve. Nancy's face floated in my mind, her smile a bittersweet memory that pierced my heart. I clung to the image of her, a beacon in the dark sea of my despair. With a shaky breath, I unscrewed the cap of the bottle. The pills lay there, innocuous yet deadly. This was it, my final act, a sacrifice to protect those I cared for. My death would be a shield, a barrier against the darkness that threatened to consume us all. I penned this note, a final testament to the truth of my experiences. To whoever reads this, I implore you to believe me, to heed my warning. Be vigilant, be cautious, for the world is not as it seems. There are shadows that lurk in the corners of reality, dangers that defy explanation. To my family, I leave my love, a love that transcends the boundaries of life and death. Know that I did this to protect you, to keep you safe from the horrors that stalked my every waking moment. And to Isabella, if by some cruel twist of fate you ever read these words, know that my final thoughts were of defiance. You may have claimed my life, but you will never claim my spirit. Vern in hell. <laughs>